go ahead and get this thing started. Let's get on the uh, announcement out of the way that always gets a few booze. It has to do with smoking, but um, boo, we don't get it. <laughs> no controversy. <laughs> no, there's no must. But um, really, just during the um, actual progress of the meeting here, if you would refrain from smoking in this main room, if you need to smoke and can get out, why, go ahead and uh, <laughs> sneak off to either side and have a smoke and come on back in. But it just won't. I'm sorry. Oh. I thought there was an announcement. Uh, I'd like to start out by reading the preamble to AA. I'm sorry. I can hear every word. I keep breaking my train of thought. I'd like to start out by reading the preamble to AA. Alcoholics Anonymous is a fellowship of men and women who share their experience, strength, and hope with each other that they may solve their common problems and help others to recover from alcoholism. The only requirement for membership is the desire to stop drinking. There are no dues or fees for AA membership. We are self-supporting through our own contribution. AA is not allied with any sect, denomination, politics, organization, or institution. Does not wish to engage in any controversy, neither endorses nor opposes any causes. Our primary purpose is to stay sober and help other alcoholics to achieve sobriety. My name is Sandy Beach, and I'm an alcoholic, and I'd like to welcome everybody here this morning to a discussion of uh, some of AA's steps and um, we're running this on tape for the last time. Maybe we'll settle back down to our normal schedule, but the uh, Psychiatric Institute Foundation is going to get a series of these um, tapes that they can use in some of their other hospitals, and so that's what this is all about. So if you want to say anonymous, laugh with a different um, <laughs> tone in your voice, and nobody will know you were here. <laughs> you have friends who can recognize you. I know her, laugh anywhere. <laughs> And there you are. Your anonymity has got to hell. <laughs> and you know how concerned we are about that. And, uh, anybody finding out that we are in AA, we don't mind them finding out that we drink a lot and throw up on our lawn every morning. <laughs> <laughs> that they should find out that we're an alcoholic anonymous because that's just going too far. <laughs> so I'm just warning you ahead of time. <laughs> And since we're starting at the very beginning, this is my favorite uh, spot. That means I get this, a chance to talk a little bit about the uh, Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous and then eventually get into the um, first three steps. And I enjoy talking about the Fellowship of AA. I enjoy observing it and I enjoy being part of this uh, phenomenon that has, has only recently started in 1935. It really isn't that long ago when you consider where it has come since that um, day in June of 1935 when it got started with just two members. Um, my own personal opinion is that there has um, really been but one or two phenomena similar to Alcoholics Anonymous that I can recall that has uh, what I call just a social phenomenon where principles uh, are put into practice and, and get these kind of results. Because after all this happened is that certain principles were put into action and in the period of 40 some years they have achieved uh, in excess of a million miracles. And I, it's just hard to look back through history and find a whole bunch of events where certain principles were put into uh, practice and then you had that many miracles of such a positive force. And so AA, from a uh, purely a social point of view, is an interesting phenomenon. There's more books being written about it, and I'm sure there will be eventually probably courses taught in college trying to understand how something like this could develop. At least it'll be taught in uh, psychology and philosophy courses, I'm sure. they try and come to understand that. And when they do, I am sure they will have to address the uh, 12 steps because that's going to be the explanation uh, of why it works. Is because these 
12 steps have been put into action. So for those of you that are brand new and are just coming around here trying to learn a little bit about AA, learn a little bit about alcoholism, uh, and have maybe attended a few meetings, I'm sure you've heard uh, reference to the big book and reference to the co-founders and Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob and a few of those names. So let me just review a little bit what my memory will tell us about that. And that is that the two co-founders, oddly enough, were from Vermont. And I don't know what that means, but it always has intrigued me that the two co-founders and the uh, the two drunks came from Vermont. I didn't know they did that much drinking up there, but that's where they came from. For those of you who are really interested in the trivia thing, uh, and there it is. They both came from Vermont, but they didn't have, that isn't where they got sobered up. The, uh, one got sobered up in New York, and, with, uh, and that was Bill, who was a stockbroker and a Wheeler dealer, and remained a Wheeler dealer all the way through his sobriety. And I mean, let's face it, if you read his story, you realize there were two distinct personalities, and uh, I relate much more to Bill than Dr. Bob. Dr. Bob got sober up and sort of very practical and went to meetings and has more simple approach to life. And Bill was suffered with ideas of grandiosity all the way up until he died, even though he had 30 some years of sobriety. He would have depressions and was always looking for something else, another way to get this thing going. So it was marvelous to find out that one of the co-founders was as screwed up as I am. <laughs> and, you know, and, and real life problems every day. And I could say, well, see whiz, I ought to be able to get rid of some of these anxieties and things like that. Why should you? The co-founder couldn't. And that makes me feel a little bit better. That, um, why should you? The co-founder couldn't. And that makes me feel a little bit better. That um, We're just attempting to put these principles into practice. And it's very difficult to do it perfectly. But he had achieved a measure of, um, by, by a measure, I mean about six months of sobriety through um, sort of a word of mouth um, bit of information about the Oxford movement, which had preceded AA. But they were both very spiritual oriented uh, type of approaches. But his sobriety, when, you know, was being uh, handled by himself. He was it. And um, his initial thoughts before he went off to Akron on this business trip were that he could go out and find some other drunks to talk to in an attempt to help them. And those were his motives then, prior to going to Akron. Uh, because he felt pretty good about having a few months of not drinking and was willing to share this. But it wasn't until he got on this business trip, and uh, I don't know if any of you can relate to this, but here was a guy who had once been very successful, had a lot of money, had really done well in uh, Wall Street as a broker, and now, you know, had been reduced to nothing, but was making a rebound, and was on his way back up. And the total recovery was dependent on this deal in Akron. And I don't know if you have had everything depending on this one event. The total future happiness, your whole future is depending on this one. I don't know how we get ourselves set up in deals like that, but we do it, we do it all the time. You know, oh, if this doesn't come through, that's it for my whole life, forever and ever, and further than forever and ever. And uh, so, you know, when you get in that kind of a mental set, you really are ready to be upset. And he arrives in, uh, in Akron, and the deal gets wrapped up in a lawsuit, and there's people going back and forth, and it's obviously not going to turn out the way he had ordered it to prior to leaving New York. And as you read the history, you, find, you can sort of picture him in the hotel in Akron, and he's coming down, he's really starting to get upset about this, and looking for some relief. <laughs> How can I feel better? I can't stand all the feelings that are sweeping over me. And he's coming down to the hotel lobby, and the piano music is coming out of the bar. And he can hear the laughter over there. And now that's the bar over on this side of the room. And at the other end of the lobby is a directory of churches. <laughs> in the Akron area, and he looks and looks, and boy, that music sounds good, and you can just sort of see this um, <coughs> conflict that's going on back and forth, and I believe that this is the moment that the, uh, my higher power gave us AA, it was right at that moment in the uh, hotel lobby, when somehow the thought was allowed to appear in Bill Wilson's brain that said, in order for me 
In order for him to stay sober, he's going to find, have to find someone else to help. It had nothing to do with helping the other person. This was the time that when the emphasis was shifted. In order to stay alive himself, he's going to have to find someone else. And just at that moment, he went and turned, went over, and got one of the telephone numbers off of the um, uh, directory there, called up and said, you got any people having a problem with alcohol in your church? And they said, oh, do we? Boy, if we got a guy, he said, you won't believe it. And he went and saw Dr. Bob, who was a um, practicing doctor there, hardly practicing, more practicing alcoholic. And uh, it's interesting, when they got together, the Dr. Bob's main concern, and how many 12-step calls, those of you who've been around a while, can relate to this. You have a 12-step call, and the, the guy starts relating a little bit. Yes, I understand. Oh, of course, I do have a problem similar to yours, and I'm willing to go to any length to recover. But you're talking about uh, making an admission of my alcoholism. You're talking about me becoming honest, and I just can't do that to my family. I just can't do that because if I admit, you know, that I'm an alcoholic or try to make amends with the past or anything like that, my patients are going to find out and then they won't have me as a doctor anymore and then my family will starve to death. And so I'm sorry, but it doesn't seem, you know, in the interest of my family, I'm not going to stop drinking. <laughs> We're still saying that today, you know, on a sort of routine basis. Uh, I'd like to stop, but I can't. My family enjoys it too much. <laughs> what about my wife's social life? I mean, what am I going to do? Uh, stop her from having fun? I'd like to join, but I can't. So that was sort of, but fortunately, um, the relationship clicked, and uh, both of them <laughs> never had another drink until they died. And that was the beginning, with the stockbroker and the doctor in Akron, and uh, they set out best they could to um, talk to other alcoholics to find them in hospital settings, and very, very early on they would emphasize that this particular illness had no uh, way that a human power could do anything with alcoholism. It was going to have to be a spiritual recovery. And they were not just explaining this, they're doing the best of their ability, and I think we still are today in an attempt to convey this particular message. And at the end of 18 months, which is a lot of time if you think about it, they had 10 members in the world. So it got off to quite a start. 10 members and three groups, one in New York and one in Cleveland and one in Akron. And I'm sure they're sitting around going, hey, how are we going to run the meeting? And they're sitting around in homes and discussing and just sort of uh, getting an idea of what is working and what isn't. Um, and it came in the year 1939 when they had about 100 members. So you can see its growth got off a very slow start. And at that particular time, Bill did most of the writing. Uh, for the fellowship, and then I guess they'd run it by some sort of an editorial board, and they may make a few changes here and there, which they did in the big book, but it essentially was written by Bill. And there, for the first time, they set down AA 12 Steps. And those of you that haven't read the big book, it's uh, on sale in all the meetings, the big book called Alcoholics Anonymous, and it's just a story of how thousands of men and women have recovered from the illness of alcoholism. And in it, they, uh, it's funny how things are divided into 12. I don't know if it was done on purpose or by chance, but it has 12 chapters, and 11 of them uh, explain the program, and then the uh, 12th chapter consisted of 30 stories. So 30 out of the original uh, 100 had their stories in the first big book. And, of course, those people had anywhere from one to three years of sobriety. So uh, there wasn't long-term sobriety contained in those stories, but it was the beginning. And it was uh, where, for the first time, the 12 steps were written down. And this became sort of the basic text of Alcoholics Anonymous, and it's referred to as AA's Bible and AA's official book, or whatever you want to call it. And as you stay around AA, you realize there truly is no one in charge, that there really is no head person that has been set up to have just principles that each group uh, runs their own 
meeting, they do it the way they see fit, they share experience with each other, maybe some other group has a better idea, and that's sort of been how the fellowship got put together. And um, it was here in the big book that these steps got written down for the first time. Now these steps were borrowed from um, other fields, there's nothing new if you look at the steps written on the uh, wall at almost any AA meeting, you'll see that those principles aren't new. I sat out there meeting years ago and went, what's the big deal? I've known about those. You know, my son says, why didn't you ever try any of them? You know, there's a big difference between knowing about them and using them. Heaven forbid, why should I use them? I had my own plan. It wasn't working too well, but uh, it was my own, and I certainly didn't want to give up something that I wrote <laughs> for something that looked as religious. This was very suspicious to me. It looked kind of religious, and I didn't want to get involved in that. I had given up bingo years before. <laughs> I was like, fed up with religion. I didn't have anything to do with it, so I didn't, have anything, you know, I didn't want to really study that. But as I looked at it intellectually, I saw that there was nothing new up there. And uh, the A literature admits to that. It said, no, there are no new principles here. They've been borrowed from religions. They've been borrowed from philosophies. They've been borrowed from medicine, psychology. And they've just been assembled here in kind of an interesting fashion. And AA 12 steps, I, I suppose, have a couple of things that make them work. One of them is the person who is sharing the steps is not a boss or a uh, policeman or a doctor. It is another alcoholic. And so the message is coming not from someone who has developed a theory, but rather from people who have used this and are willing to share, hey, this is how I got out of hell, would you like to listen? And if you really are in hell, sometimes you do want to listen. It gets uncomfortable in there, and that's the reason that our mind starts to open up slightly towards these steps, is that we realize the message is coming from someone just like ourselves. So one of the things that Steph has going for them is who is giving the message. It's not an authority figure looking down. Everybody that we talk to prior to coming in AA is talking down to us alcoholics. You people are stop drinking out there. Very good advice, but we don't like the direction that it's coming from. We're lying on, the, uh, on our backs in the street and people are pointing down and talking to us about our drinking and we don't like that relationship. And here's someone who's been there who wants to share how they got up on their feet. The other thing that is um, interesting about the steps is the manner in which they're presented. I often wonder, and that's been wondered in some of the AA literature, how these steps would have fared had they been written uh, as commandments. <laughs> And now you're new in AA, and you sit down there, and a guy gets up there with sort of a German accent and says, You will admit you're powerless over alcohol, and your life's unmanageable. You will do this. And I think we would have gone right out the door, because that is never related to being ordered into doing anything. And here, this was I wasn't even in those steps. It didn't say anything about me as a new person. All it says, we did this. We, people who have already done it. I'm not even there until I've done it. And I'm looking at it, and I'm sort of an outsider, and they're sharing what they have done. These are steps that we've taken that have worked uh, as a program of recovery for us. And if you're interested in recovery, this works. I mean, at least it did for us. And that's sort of, there it is. They just sit there on the wall, meeting after meeting, as we attend the meetings and look up there, and they're always there, and they're always waiting, and they're very patient in these principles. They're, they'll always work. They're quite reliable. And I think they wait until we've heard enough to want to try it. And then we say, what is that stuff about the 12 steps? Maybe I do want to take a shot at looking at those. Um, so that's sort of um, a little bit about the general nature of the 12 steps. There's a lot involved to the steps. Um, in order to make them simple, I think you have to do a lot of groundwork. I really think that, um, yes, we do attempt to keep it simple. But keeping it simple requires a great deal of effort. 
I compare that to uh, watching a good golfer. When their swing is perfect, it looks so simple, it's ridiculous. He hardly expends any effort. You just, uh, look how simple that swing is. And I see some people's lives who are that way. They, they just live so comfortably and so simple, following some just some basic principles, but it took a great deal of effort to weed out all the other ideas, to weed out all of the alternatives that we brought with us into the fellowship. And that's what the steps do. They enable us to get rid of all of the things that prevent us from keeping it simple, from keeping it down to what uh, these principles really teach. And so keeping it simple is true, but it requires a great deal of effort to get there. As time went along, um, I think the co-founders realized that they were learning a great deal more about these principles. They learned, number one, that they truly were working for everyone. Because as time went by, there was more and more groups, more and more states around the country started getting into groups, and it started going around into other countries. And so they knew as time went by, number one, that the steps were working as written. And of course, none of the words have ever been changed. And the big book remains essentially the same, except for adding more and different stories. Near the end, as AA began to encompass more and more women were coming in, more and more young people. And so they got stories um, appropriate uh, to put in the revised versions of the big book. And so in... Um, 1952, the second book that um, I think is of interest to us, which is AA's 12 Steps and 12 Traditions, was written and published. And here, with 13 more years of sobriety, the founders were able to expand a little bit on the 12 Steps and to take a little uh, deeper look at them. And this book has become my favorite, The 12 Steps and 12 Traditions, as a source of reading to look into um, what these principles are, how they can be applied to my life, and how I might find a better plan for living. Because I really believe we all come in here with our own little way of approaching life. And we've learned it probably through half-open eyes from a TV set, from an older brother or an older sister, a little bit from our parents and the neighbors threw some ideas in, a mean school teacher banged a couple of deals in there, read a couple of books, saw a couple of movies, saw I had a hero in a movie who I had to be like, and I put a plan together of what was the way to react and how life went. And it got me locked up a lot. Uh, I also threw up a lot. I had GPs. I was frightened. But I did have a plan. I mean, you know, and it was uh, chugging along, putting me into an early grave. And I did not want to relinquish this plan. I really didn't. It was sort of mine. And I knew how it was. And I, I like to say little things like this. But I've always done it this way. I've always done this. I mean, why should I change now? And I said, well, maybe if you've heard enough, you'd be interested in a slight change to your plan. And uh, my plan did not involve anything spiritual. My plan didn't involve, it involved getting another car in the garage. That was important. I had learned that very young. The three-car garage with three cars in it means you're happy. And I knew that, and I never did get three cars in a three-car garage. Although at one point I had two cars in a two-car garage, and I knew that I was close to being happy. I was, I was still miserable, but I was almost going to get ready to be happy because one more garage and one more car, and then I'd finally be happy and I wouldn't be frightened and angry all the time. And I never got the other car, but I did get happy. So maybe my plan was wrong. In the 12 and 12, they um, have, in the introduction, they write the following little sentence. It says, AA's 12 steps are a group of principles, spiritual in nature, which if practiced as a way of life will do two things. And one is, it will expel the obsession with drinking. And the second one is, it will enable the suffering alcoholic to become happily and usefully whole. And there's two words in there that fascinate me. One of them is obsession, and the other one is useful. Uh, boy, those are critical factors in sobriety. It turns out that in the first step, which says we admitted we were powerless over alcohol and our lives had become unmanageable, 
But it's a process of education. If there is one thing that prevents us alcoholics from getting sober, it's ignorance. It's not knowing what alcoholism is and not knowing how to live without alcohol. And so in the process of learning about what it means to be powerless over alcohol, we find out what AA has to say about the disease of alcoholism, and it points out that it is like a double-edged sword. And the one edge of the sword most of us are quite familiar with, and that is the physical allergy type of reaction to alcohol. And this is what happens to the alcoholic when alcohol is put inside of him or her. And we all are quite familiar with what this is. As the years have gone by, we find that when we put one drink in, we have a uh, compulsion to drink a whole bunch more. Many of us intended to only um, have one drink, and we ended up spending a week before we came back. Uh, and we find that strange things happen to us as we're putting the alcohol inside of us. We lose control over our lives. We uh, stop any of the plans that we had before we put the alcohol in. And then we find out that uh, it is sort of destroying us from the inside out. It's uh, taking away our self-respect. It's taking away our physical health. Uh, we're getting locked up. We're getting fired from jobs. We're uh, going to the doctor and he's suggesting that our liver may go on display after we die <laughs> as the biggest that has ever been captured. <laughs> Look at this, and we're, you know, and so we're finding out what is happening to our system by pouring vast quantities of vodka through the uh, experiment here. And that seems to be the end of the uh, problem in many people's eyes, that uh, this is what you study, is the effects of alcohol, and, and it turns out that we can all realize that you keep, if we keep pouring that amount in there, it's going to kill the person. That that's sort of part of the illness of alcohol. We are going to die from this particular illness. That is something that is of interest to doctors, and I think it's of interest to uh, students of alcoholism, but it's not very much interest to Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, AA really says, well, that's nice that people have big livers, it's nice that the alcohol does this to people, but what do we care about that? You don't find that meeting, everyone's sitting around drinking, trying to figure out, well, how big will the liver get? Let's do some more research on this. A is not interested in that part of the illness of alcoholism, because that's not the part that really does the damage. Um, if, if we had a similar reaction uh, to mayonnaise, we probably would stop eating and using mayonnaise. If we found mayonnaise was destroying our liver and was tearing our insides up, we wouldn't be doing the things we're doing with alcohol. We would simply say, hey, I'm one of these people, I was born with this kind of an allergy and I'm going to eliminate it. I'm allergic to penicillin and I am very careful to inform every doctor. I do not want another one of those reactions that cause all kinds of uh, horrible physical problems. And so, I'm, you know, I just very careful to not uh, have any penicillin get in my body. And that's what I would do with mayonnaise if I had a similar allergy. It would not be like alcohol. I would not be going to bed at night thinking, uh, wonder if my jar of mayonnaise is still in my closet and, uh, or somebody taken it. And then I'd run over and look in the closet and, yeah, okay, it's there. And, uh, uh, I'd be able to sleep knowing that my mayonnaise was there. I wasn't going to take any, but at least it was there. I would have the mayonnaise in a Hellman's jar, even though it was giant brand. You know. Because <laughs> I, you know, I wouldn't want anybody to think I couldn't afford it. <laughs> Hellman's uh, and all that. So, now we're starting to get to the part of the alcoholism that is the killer. This is this strange relationship. Uh, with thinking about drinking all the time, uh, with thinking about that source of all our trouble, because the source of all our trouble appears to be the answers to all our problems. It has disguised itself as our plan for living, and that's what the vodka was. I was absolutely obsessed 
with the idea that I had discovered the fountain of youth. I really think that that's what I thought alcohol was. I said, hey, I have stumbled on the answer to life. I have stumbled on all of religion and philosophy and psychiatry rolled up into one vodka label. There it is. The answer to everything. If you're worried, you drink. If you're frightened, you drink. If you're upset, you drink. You're going to a party, drink before you to learn to adjust to people. You just drink. And then they can adjust to you. <laughs> Let them clean up the vomit. What do I care about this? I've, you know, I've got a different way of handling this stuff. All you have to do is get enough money and you've got it. You can buy your way into maturity. <laughs> that was sort of how I approached drinking. And therefore, I had developed an obsession with thinking about drinking. People would say to me, look, the way you can get over this relationship about that girl in high school that left you, which was 20 years ago, you realize, uh, and you have been patching up that hurt with vodka, but it's still there after 20 years, uh, maybe you should try and deal with it emotionally as a mature person. I said, why would I want to start doing that now? I mean, why, why would I want to start growing up at age 40? I mean, you know, that's for somebody who's a teenager to do. So, well, you're getting a lot of pain to learn to adjust to people. You just drink, and then they can adjust to you. <laughs> Let them clean up the vomit. What do I care about this? I've, you know, I've got a different way of handling this stuff. All you have to do is get enough money, and you've got it. You can buy your way into maturity. <laughs> that was sort of how I approached drinking. And therefore, I had developed an obsession with thinking about drinking. People would say to me, look, the way you can get over this relationship about that girl in high school that left you, which was 20 years ago, you realize, uh, and you have been patching up that hurt with vodka, but it's still there after 20 years, uh, maybe you should try and deal with it emotionally as a mature person. I said, why would I want to start doing that now? I mean, what? Why would I want to start growing up at age 40? I mean, you know, that's for somebody who's a teenager to do. So, well, you're getting a lot of pain. You know, you see, I can simply buy vodka if it really gets bad. If it really gets bad, I can start drinking. And that's what um, the obsession is. It's this constant thought that is triggered in our minds to think, hey, if it really gets bad, I can always drink. And all AA is saying, and this is what AA is trying to deal with, AA is trying to remove that obsession. Once that obsession is removed, which is done on sort of a daily basis, uh, we can be comfortable. We can then go about our lives and start dealing with our other problems on a mature human basis. But until the obsession is removed, it's going to appear any time it wants to, because that's the nature of an obsession. It's going to come in and dominate our minds and prevent us from doing other things like the rest of AA steps, like uh, words, like growing churches, like maturing, whatever it is. And so the problem is, how do you get rid of an obsession? How do you stop thinking about a single thought that keeps popping into your mind? And we joke around about that. You know, okay, starting right now, I'm never going to think about drinking. That's the end of it. I'm going to use my willpower. You know, just focus my attention on the day's problems as they come along, starting now. And then... Budweiser comes right up into the head. <laughs> Where did that come from? Okay, I'm going to start over again. I'm not going to look at any magazines, keep the television off and all that. You know. <laughs> Never going to think about drinking. And suddenly find out, how do you do it? You can't do that. You just can't do that. And that is sort of AA's message in the first step is the situation is much more hopeless than you thought it was. That's the message when you come into AA. No matter how bad off you thought it was, AA starts right out by saying, oh, wrong. it's much worse than you thought it was. And until you believe it's much worse than you thought it was, the steps are going to just stay on the wall unread. Unless you think it's, see, these things really probably should have a thing over the top that says, in case of emergency, take the 12 steps. You know, that's sort of our initial entrance into those steps, is when we really believe that we're going to die. And until we understand that obsession, our illness is liable to be different from other people. We're liable to say, yeah, I relate to other alcoholics dying, but I don't see where it's going to kill me. Because I can just stop, really, if it got that bad as that guy over there who's uh, into those BTs. But if I ever get like that, I would stop. But for an alcoholic,
talk all we have this obsession. We're just a, a little sooner down the path. We're just, you know, a few years behind that, man. And it's absolutely inevitable that that's where we're going to go. And um, the problem is, how are we going to get rid of that obsession? And it turns out that there is no human power that can get rid of it. That we're forced into a uh, admission of absolute defeat. And I think if we have a good sponsor when we first come into AA, that we will be taught how hopeless our situation is. And if you uh, if you are new, I hope you do get a sponsor who hammers that in. That your situation is absolutely hopeless. There is no way that you can do anything about that obsession. And you may think you can, but forget it. And it's under those conditions that I myself and I think other AA members become willing to really listen to what the heck's going on. I said, my God, you mean that there isn't a chance for me? And that's right, there isn't. Given our own resources and our past, if we go out and attempt to solve this on our own, it's inevitable that we're going to pour more alcohol in there and we're going to just repeat it and it's going to get worse. And so we truly are on a um, inevitable crash. Very similar to the person jump out this window and on the way down says, maybe it's not so bad as I thought it was. I had heard a lot about falling, but it doesn't seem to be hurting now. <laughs> uh, this is what happens when we get an AA and our health resumes a little bit. We're not shaking anymore. We're like, hey, it's not so bad. You realize that it's going to take a miracle to prevent you from hitting the ground. And so the point of AA's first step is, why don't you start asking for a miracle? That's what the first step is trying to teach, is to, uh, to get our attention to the two by four or whatever, so that we go, help! <laughs> and once that happens, then it seems that we're saved. It's one of the first paradoxes in AA that you win by giving up. As soon as you admit that you've lost, you win. But until you admit that you've lost, you're going to lose. And it's very strange. But that's how it seems to work. Because that's, we have to break that will, we have to break that self-centeredness, and boy, those old ideas have got a death grip on us. We don't want to let go of them. we got a plan. We know. Uh, we don't want to hear. We don't want to hear. That's exactly right. I don't want to hear anything there. And um, somehow we're going to have to listen. And learning to listen is you have to think that you need to listen in order to really listen. And that's what the first step does. It gets our attention long enough so that we're willing to listen. How can I be saved? How can I get this obsession removed? Well, this is how we had it removed. We decided that we needed something besides ourselves to rely on. The philosophy of self-sufficiency wasn't paying off, and we needed to um, come to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity, which is AA's second step. A power greater than ourselves can restore us to sanity. In the beginning, this power may be the AA group, and it may be that the group that you join, you finally can believe, um, can do something about your alcoholism. And you look about the group and they say, yeah, I've been sober six months, I've been sober a year, I've been sober two years. They say, well, they know more about uh, sobriety than I do. Maybe I'll let them um, take care of my drinking problem. I'll go that far as just sort of listen to what they have to say about the drinking problem. And that's the beginning of the second step of coming to believe that this group, which is um, a greater power than we are, can restore us to sanity. And sanity in the 12 and 12 is defined as soundness of mind. And when we get into thinking about what a sound mind is, it doesn't, I don't think we want to race back and think about some of the crazy things we did while drinking. Uh, that's uh, non-alcoholics do crazy things when they're drinking. You pour enough alcohol onto a brain and stop working. And that doesn't mean that that brain isn't sound. That has nothing to do with soundness of mind. The crazy things might be with drinking. Soundness of mind is kind of like when you've been in the program a couple of months and you've been through PI, you've been through detox, you've been through Occoquan, you've been uh, in the emergency room six or eight times, you've had 12 jobs in the last two years, you don't know where your family is, your health is kind of borderline, and now you've been in AA a couple of months and you finally have come to realize that all of your problems are caused by drinking, that every single mishap you've ever been in was caused by your drinking. That every time you drink, you vomit, you get sick, you go up all over the place, you tremble, you shake, and now you sit with nice clothes on. You 
just been through a meeting, and you come home and you say, you know, life isn't so bad. I think I finally got a handle. I've been taught about alcoholism. I've been taught I'm an alcoholic. I think I'll have a drink. <laughs> that is what we're talking about in return us to sanity. Where did that thought come from with all of that information? <laughs> with all of those facts laid out on the table, the guy says, Therefore, I think that I shall have a drink. Now, that is what we're, we're trying to prevent from happening, is that kind of a thought from filtering its way up. Because it'll, it's there. It's working in, the, uh, in this computer brain of ours. It's just waiting for a resentment to produce it. You know how a resentment can start those kind of thinking. Uh, you know, the, we get somebody at the office said something like, your work isn't perfect. You know, what kind of a put down is that? <laughs> no, my work isn't perfect. They don't like me at work. They told me my work isn't perfect. Oh my God, I knew it was true. I really am no good. Well, here I am at home. Non-perfect me. <laughs> Disliked at work. Rejected again. Well, what are we going to do about it? Well, you can always drink, I guess. Yeah, well, I've been taught that drinking will kill me. Well, yeah, but geez, when you've been rejected, death is better than being rejected. I'm going to go in there tomorrow and they're going to say, we don't like your clothes either. And, uh, <laughs> you know, we don't like your political party. We don't like anything about you. I know that's coming, and then it starts. And then the next thing you know, you know, I know what I'll do. I'll go down to the bar and hang around the people down there and drink ginger ale because they understand me down in the bar. And we can down there. You know what happens. And then this is the type of thinking that is so dangerous. I think AA must or alcoholics must like high risk situations. <laughs> <It's exciting. laughs> to walk around on uh, tall buildings on the very edge and look over. I think we sort of like to move that kind of light. <laughs> but um, there are other ways of achieving excitement. Um, we've just never explored them yet. And we find out about it here in the fellowship, that uh, a spiritual life is quite exciting. It's places we've never been before, but we're about to be pushed into. Because I think our alcoholism, as we learn about this, Coming to grips in the second step in the uh, book, the 12 and 12, goes into a long discussion of the different types of us that may arrive. And I'm sure of this many people, we have that kind of a cross-section here today. We have uh, people who once had a great deal of faith. Uh, the second step is relating directly to faith. And uh, found that it didn't work, or it appeared not to work. He may have been brought up with a nice uh, uh, church training as a child and you come to understand a faith and you thought you had a higher power and then somewhere along the line it just lets you down. It just plum failed. And for the last half of your life you've been sort of living on your own. My own resources. And that isn't working either. So you've tried both the philosophy of self sufficiency and a higher power. And you're sort of wandering around aimlessly with no uh, decision one way or the other. Whereas the atheist has an advantage over you. At least he is absolutely convinced of something. Whereas you know, you're not sure either way. You don't have anything that you're convinced of. Atheist is convinced there is no, he can prove the non-existence of God. The agnostic is sort of coming around going, well, I just don't uh, really believe it. Uh, I don't think there is, but I can't prove it one way or the other. And we come in here a mixed bag. Many of us come in here the intellectually self-sufficient. This is well, very common in the Washington, D.C. area. <laughs> <laughs> intellectually self-sufficient. Um, the reason you may not know about it is all of us intellectually self-sufficient people keep it a secret <laughs> so that we don't embarrass the non-intellectually self-sufficient. So you see, each of you that are sitting here has your own little secret about being, you know, going, look at this crowd that I'm in with. And you sort of look around the crowd. And but when you're doing that, you've got to realize there's someone else looking at you the same way. Hey, I'm sitting in here. And uh, we secretly float above the rest of the people. We have this marvelous potential that we've never used. And um, we do have the answers. We're just not going to use them. <laughs> I do know how to behave, but I seem to misbehave. That marvelous sense of maturity right there. And, um, and uh, but we don't share this with anybody. We, you know, it's our little secret. We had this in bars. I used to go in very low neighborhoods, and I used to feel superior in the bar. You know, and they love me because I bring a lot of money in there, and they'd all take it. 
And uh, it was a, sort of an even exchange. I paid to feel superior. And then when I left, everybody really felt superior because they ripped me off. So it was a... <laughs> uh, I don't know who was winning in that deal. <laughs> but that's the type of crowd that comes in here that is asked to rally around the second step. And the second step really is sort of a rallying point for all of these mixed breeds and half-breeds and different varieties come in and come up against the same dilemma. Whatever our past have been, we're going to have to forget them and all start on the same road here at the second step. We are going to have to come to believe that something greater than ourselves can get rid of that obsession, or we're all going to fall by the wayside. And we've discussed the wayside before at other meetings, and we've had several people who've been to the wayside recently who have reported it as a bad place to go. <laughs> it is not a, one of your higher class spots. The wayside is a bad spot to fall by. It was even back in biblical times they talked about the wayside. It must have been bad back then, too, because when people fell by the wayside, they were never heard from again. <laughs> a bad spot to fall. And, and it still is. And so here the second step is sort of where we consider, well, whatever the past has been, I'm going to have to forget it and get involved in finding my own personal higher power. I'm going to have to find that uh, in order to prevent these old ideas from constantly doing to me what they've been doing all my life. And so that's sort of what the second step is. It is the rallying point for the great variety of uh, uniqueness that comes into AA. If you sit here new and think you're unique, that's right. That's what everybody does when they come in. We have a unique set of problems, and the newcomer's favorite expression is, so you don't understand. You don't understand my situation. That is uh, just you ought to have a saying on the wall, but you don't understand because it is one of the most oft-quoted statements in the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. You don't understand my problem. Um, anyway, this is going to kind of unite us in this, in this purpose, and then comes the uh, third step, which is kind of the doorway into the rest of AA's 12 steps, and that is made a decision to turn our own lives over the care of God as we are good. This step is the first one of AA steps that requires action. And these first two steps are some sort of an acceptance, sort of an intellectual process that we went through, but the third step does require a affirmative plan of action. Because while we understand uh, the concept of the third step of making a decision, there's one key quality that is necessary in order to accomplish it, and that is called willingness. And this willingness this is a quality that each of us can develop, but may be lacking due to our old ideas. Um, the growth in AA is a strange, and I look upon it as almost a paradox in itself, because the way we build ourselves up is by tearing ourselves down. Uh, the way that new ideas seem to come in is by getting rid of old ideas. It's a constant process of inventorying ourselves in order to find out what's wrong and removing it, and eventually we're left with what's right. And it turns out it has been there all along. And the third step is the entrance way into this process. It is the process by which we develop this particular willingness to um, make this attempt. This is not a new practice. I think it's been around for a long time. It is one of the um, processes that is used in many religions and philosophies to attempt to get rid of the self. Uh, to make a decision to turn our lives over to the care of some higher power. And AA has always been very careful. It was written now by other drunks, and they knew damn well that if they tried to define a God for a new drunk coming in, he'd turn right around and walk out. And it says, no, you're going to have to come up with the definition of your own higher power. You personally are going to have to come to grips with what a higher power is for you. Whether your name is Joe or Mary or Fred, what is your particular God? And what is um, uh, the relationship that you can establish with it? Because until you are able to come to rely on that, you're going to continue to rely on yourself. And this reliance on yourself 
is uh, going to produce the same results that have been produced all these years. Some of the writings that our co-founders had are quite interesting, and I, before, I we're running out of time, and I did want to read something out of the big book, and then I'll get back and wrap up the third step. This was written at the end of uh, the very last page, two pages in the um, uh, first 11 chapters in the big book. You've got to realize this is back in 1939, and Bill Wilson is writing, he's wrapping up uh, his story, to, uh, or the story of AA. That's what they attempt to tell him here, is trying to say, hey, you got a hold of this book? Well, this is, we're going to tell you about AA. And he's wrapping it up, and he says, someday we hope that every alcoholic who journeys will find a fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous at its destination. To some extent, this is already true. Some of us are salesmen and go about. Little clusters of pools and trees and five of us have sprung up in other communities through contact with our two larger centers. Those of us who travel drop in as often as we can. This practice enables us to lend a hand at the same time avoiding certain alluring distractions of the road about which, <laughs> <laughs> about which any traveling man can inform you. <laughs> Thus we grow, and so can you, though you be but one man with this book in your hand. We believe and hope it contains all you will need to begin. Still you may say, but I will not have the benefit of the contact with you who wrote this book. We cannot be sure. God will determine that. So you must remember that your real reliance is always upon him. He will show you how to create the fellowship you crave. And I just noticed that crave was in there in this, uh, Dr. Thiebaud's discussion of the phenomenon of craving as the, uh, for alcohol. And maybe that was the craving for this kind of fellowship that we were seeking in that uh, bottle that Bill picked up in this particular discussion here, that we will learn how to create intuitively the fellowship that we crave. Our book is meant to be suggestive only. We realize we know only a little. God will constantly disclose more to you and to us. Ask him in your morning meditation what you can do each day for the man who is still sick. The answers will come if your own house is in order. But obviously you cannot transmit something you haven't got. See to it that your relationship with him is right, and great events will come to pass for you and countless others. This is the great fact for us. Abandon yourself to God as you understand God. Admit your faults to him and to your fellows. Clear away the wreckage of your past. Be freely of what you find and join us. We shall be with you in the fellowship of the Spirit, and you will surely meet some of us as you trudge the road of happy destiny. And I like that word, as you trudge the road of happy destiny, because that's the journey that we seem to be on as we move through the third step. As we've been in AA over the years, this has been, uh, I've been to a lot of closed meetings and discussion meetings, and I hear the third step discussed probably as much as any other step. How am I going to get out of the driver's seat? How am I going to turn my will and my life over to a higher power? How am I going to do this? How will I know when I've done it? What does it feel like? Do you get some kind of a blast of light? What is this uh, event? And you know, third step simply talks about making a decision to do this. Simply making a decision and the willingness to do this to take our willpower, and the uh, third step ends with a discussion of willpower. And it is an essential ingredient in uh, sobriety. It's an essential ingredient in life. It's an essential ingredient in developing discipline. And our problem prior to AA had been the misuse of willpower. We had attempted to bombard our problems. We said, I'm unhappy. I'm going to force happiness. I'm going to use my willpower and achieve this. And it suggests in the third step that the proper use of willpower was an attempt to bring our will and all of this effort and energy into harmony with that of a higher power. To somehow learn through these other steps what, this, what we should be doing. What is the right thing? How can I be useful? Come up with a whole set of new directions and then use this energy to achieve that. And so I would say that the answer to the question, how do I know if I have taken the third step, can be the answer that my sponsor gave to me when he said, let me see the piece of paper on which you wrote your fourth step inventory. And I would say, if you can produce the piece of paper, you have indeed become willing. 
because that is no small effort to move into the remainder of AA's 12 steps. They involve a lot of pain, they involve a lot of effort, they involve other people, they involve things that are contrary to our nature, and they involve abandoning our plan for living that we brought in here and are clutching onto with our death grip. And that truly is the measure of our willingness. If we find ourselves sitting on the third step saying, I don't think that I understand it, I think we're just procrastinating. I think we're just spinning our wheels. Because the true effort is in uh, a day-by-day -day attempt at moving through the rest of the steps, which we'll discuss when we come back uh, next week. Uh, this ends our little discussion this morning. So let's take a 10-minute break, and we'll come back in, and we'll let you all participate in uh, the discussion meeting.